Hello everybody once again. Welcome to the Prismata News and Game Dev Insights Show. I am your host Elliot. Today's show is going to be a bit different than the ones we've done in the past. Um, rather than sort of talk about the ongoings of Prismata and sort of decisions we've made, I'm going to talk a bit more personally about how I got into game dev. And um, you know, originally I had planned on doing a sort of my history with game dev show and I kind of realized that there's probably enough content in there for, for like many, many episodes. So this is kind of part one of that. Uh, a, a series of episodes where I'm going to sort of talk about how I got into da game dev and sort of stuff I did in the past, lessons that I learned as a game designer, um, different projects that I worked on, people I worked with, people that have inspired me. Um, and it'll be kind of fun, you know, you get to see uh, really janky things that are not polished products like Prismata aims to be. Um, and, you know, a bit of my own personal experience. Um, so let's get right to it. Um, I'm going to go chronologically. So I am going to start with the very first game design work I ever did in my life. Um, and before I even talk about that, I want to kind of talk about my history playing games. Um, I started playing games when I was about three and a half years old. Um, my parents had a Nintendo Entertainment System. This was in like 1990. I was born 1987, so it was probably like 1991. Um, my parents had a Nintendo Entertainment System, and I, I just had Super Mario Brothers, the first three games. And I played those to death as a little kid, you know, like a three-year-old. Um, and those are actually video games that three-year-olds are perfectly capable of playing because they don't really need any reading, they don't really need any complex strategizing or anything. It's just hand-eye coordination moving around. Um, and I played those games a ton and I was like enthralled with this idea of like moving a man on the screen with a controller, right? Like that was the coolest thing in the world when I was a little kid. Um, and I got very inspired to want to create those types of things myself, right? I think it's a natural human tendency. Um, media that you enjoy, you also want to create. There is a need to create. And the, the thing you most want to create is often the thing you enjoy the most, right? Um, and so this past holidays, I was like hanging out with my family. I was hanging out at my mom's house and she had this bin of stuff from when I was a kid. Um, and of course I made all kinds of drawings and, and you know, stuff that kids do. Um, and I was digging through it and I pulled out stuff that I made as a kid that was video game related. Um, and I have a stack of it right here. So, um, you know, and, and this is mostly stuff I made between the ages of like three years old and 10 years old, uh, often inspired by the games I was playing at the time. And, uh, you know, this was a pastime of me as a kid. I'll show you where I started out. And I'm so grateful to my mom for keeping all this stuff and archiving this stuff. I remember being very young and my mom got me a book of mazes. Um, and I'm just gonna adjust the camera now, point it down to my desk so you can see all this crap as I show it to you. And one of the very first things that I remember drawing as a kid was just tons and tons of mazes. Um, and a lot of kids draw mazes. It's a very common thing in young children. Um, and this is, you know, you can see sort of different structures and different stuff like that. Um, you know, and, and sort of different drawings. And there's actually tons and tons of pages of this stuff. Um, and I actually used to play a lot with Lego. Here's a picture of me. Um, I was probably about five or six years old. You can see I'm kind of, kind of fat baby face there. Um, but there's a picture of me, and this is, um, well, there's a close-up shot of it. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. Um, what this was, was, I like. It, levels in the Mario Brothers series are composed of tiles or blocks. That was kind of a limitation of the NES at the time. But as a consequence, it's very easy to build these levels out of something like Lego bricks. So this was me attempting to create a series of Mario levels out of Lego bricks. 
And of course, there's no enemies and no items power-ups or, or anything. It's, it's mostly just bricks that you could jump on. Um, but at this age, I at least sort of acknowledged that, you know, Mario could jump five spaces high. If Mario was running, he could jump this many spaces forward and, and stuff like that. And so this was, uh, I, I guess the levels kind of go back and forth in a series because I didn't really have uh, a Lego base that was long enough to put them all together. Um, but, you know, there's a full series of, I don't know how many, it looks like about 20 different short stages comprised of bricks. And I can't tell if any of them are sort of copied from existing levels in that video game or whether or not they're just all brand new, but I imagine I was creating uh, stuff. And it's fully 2D, right? There's no 3D stuff in there. Um, I mean, I might have... I remember trying to build some 3D stuff just because, you know, you have Lego in your hands and you kind of realize, well, what if Mario could move in 3D? Um, and we'll get to 3D stuff later. Um, but this this was entirely 2D. Um, also in the same set of photos, this is, this is a photo, it's completely out of focus, I'm sorry, but this is uh, a Zelda Link to the Past with all of the items, and if you notice, there's a little tiny zero next to Link, which means you beat the whole game with zero deaths. And I remember doing that as a challenge when I was a kid and being so ridiculously proud of it, and, and my mom snapped a photo of it as a memento. Um, so now we get to this. Okay. This was... I, I wish I had dates on this. Um, but I could sort of tell by my handwriting that I, I was probably quite young when I did this. Um, and this is... It's really long. Okay, what this is... I'll have to flip it upside down so y'all can see it. Um, I made my entire own Super Mario Brothers 32 levels. You know, worlds 1 to 8. So, like, you know, there's 1-1. There's one, one. Um, and I, I guess that's a piranha plant. Um, you know, I, I was a bastard. 1-1 one, one in Mario shouldn't have piranha plants yet. That's sort of introduced later. Um, I'm trying to figure out what all these things are, but I, I have no idea. And I think there's a flag at the end or a castle. That must be a castle and a flag. Um, you know, and there's 1-3. And it, it just goes on. Um... You know, there's World 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, and, it, you know, it, you could, you must think this, this would have taken hours. Um, and there's pages and pages and pages. There's a little coffee stain on there. There's some red stuff. I don't know if that's lava or, there's got to be some fire snakes. Um, I don't know. That There's, there's clearly an underwater stage there. Um. But I, I don't know. My my parents, I think, might have thought there was something wrong with me, but they were very happy to encourage me to just, just go nuts and build stuff. There's World 8. Uh, so it's front and back, and this is like many pages of paper that have been uh, scotch-taped together. So this is what I was doing as a little kid. Um, let's see, where are we? As I got older... Um, I started doing some sort of more advanced stuff. Uh, this is, I think this, this must be Super Mario Brothers 2, because right there there's a thing that says dig dirt, and there's this grid of squares. And if you played Super Mario Brothers 2, there's all these levels where you have to go digging through the sand, and I'm pretty sure that's what this is. Um, so my guess is these are levels modeled after the rule set in SMB2. Um, and, I don't know, you got like the beanstalks with those weird like face dudes that climb up them. Um, are there, there are things that spit fire, right? The, the pantsers or whatever they're called. Um, and I don't know, I did a ton of this stuff and I'm so grateful to my mom for saving this. But it's, it's quite involved, like the levels are, they snake around and they're kind of maze-like and there's keys and locks and uh, all that stuff in there. I'm upside down here. Um, you know, I don't want to bore you to death with uh, just just loads and loads of stuff I made. Okay, this this is kind of cool because this is this is evidence of what it was. Okay, there's the word cast right there, which I wrote. And once you finish Super Mario Bros. 2, during the credits, it plays the cast, which is all of the enemies in the game, and that 
that handwriting is not mine. That's my mom's handwriting. So somehow I got her to like write down the names of all the enemies in the game. Cause I, I remember I couldn't read. Like I was too young to read. I hadn't learned to read or write yet. And I remember playing like Legend of Zelda Link to the Past and having to like call my mom to help me with the reading because I, I just hadn't learned to read yet. And she would tell me, you know, I'd talk to the wise man or whatever and what he said. And I remember getting stuck in that game multiple times because I just like didn't know what to do. But I, I didn't really care that I was stuck. Um, and so somehow these are all the enemies. I don't know, there's, there's tons of this. I must have spent hours on this crap. Like this, this must have been my pastime whenever I, I couldn't play video games or my parents had decided I'd had enough. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, okay, this was like, this is the biggest piece of chart paper ever. I don't even know how to show it off to you. Um, but I remember very distinctly, um, ah, yes, this, this, okay, this is a lot of fun. So... This stuff right here, okay, this up here is just more like side-scroller video games. I, I think these are levels modeled after... Those look like moving platforms, so it reminds me of Super Mario Bros. 2 Yoshi's Island. Maybe it's that. This stuff down here... Let me tell you about a video game that I, I played a lot as a kid. And I would have been older, probably five, six, seven years old. Um, I have... Okay. Um... Just gonna switch the cam around. Okay, that's that's not it. This one. Okay, yeah. So this is a list of games that I like played a ton as a kid. One was Super Mario World. So obviously, very very inspired by that. Um, second was Zelda: Link to the Past, and there's definitely Zelda levels in here. So we eventually moved away from uh, side scrollers to sort of top down levels. Um, and my first 3D game that I really got into is this game called Equinox. Um, this game is known widely as being insanely unfair to the player. It has a lot of, like, you know, hidden things that kill you, secret doors that if you don't find them you can't progress in the game, totally unfair boss fights where if you get hit once you have to completely restart. Um, but it had this 3D orthographic perspective, and it actually had a lot of puzzles in the game that made use of it as a mechanic. Like, you'd get in a room like this, and there'd be boxes floating in the air, and you'd have no friggin' clue where they are, because of the projection of the three-dimensionality. And so this right here, I'm gonna go back to the cam full screen. These are my own levels that I designed in the rule set of that game, Equinox, uh, for SNES. And I have stacked 3D boxes drawn as sort of concentric squares. So if there's three squares in a row, um, that means a stack of boxes three squares tall. And the game had a rule set like you could only jump up one square, you could only jump over one square, and they had sort of enemies that moved around. And, and there's a room right there that says boss. So apparently I knew enough to have boss rooms. Um, you can see there's more of it right here. Uh, this game had sprawling dungeon maps with dozens of rooms. I think the last dungeon had over a hundred rooms. Um, a very complicated. Um, and a game that I totally loved. Uh, these sort of bold black circles, they're, they're kind of hard to see on the map. You can see them more easily over here. Those are the tokens. And the rule of that game was every dungeon had 12 tokens and you had to collect all 12 and then summon the boss. So I kind of like, this is an unfinished dungeon map where I had decided where the tokens were going to go. They're, they're like in all the dead ends, basically. Um, but I had not yet populated the rooms with content. And you can see over here, um, somehow there's like letters. I don't know what P's and C's are. Um, maybe they're enemies or power-ups, potions, I, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I had got into some sort of pseudo 3D game making, and I, I was, I was probably older when I made this, probably seven, eight years old, more in that, um, that age. There's gotta be some Zelda levels in here somewhere, I don't know where. There's, there's actually like a whole stack of, of stuff. I kind of just pulled off the most relevant ones. Okay, this one... Um, what was that? That Zelda? I can't even tell. There's, there's somehow, this was a school project where I had to like draw a self-portrait 
And in the margins, I just like did level design because I don't know. That was that was me as a kid. Um, gonna switch back to the screen. Um, there's a game for SNES called Earthbound, and this game came out a bit later, so I must have been like eight, nine years old by the time I did this. Um, Earthbound had a variety of interesting dungeon designs that involved a lot of like doors that led to other places. Uh, and and basically like I realized that oh okay I, I basically have like an arbitrary graph that I can use to generate mazes. Um, and so what this set of drawings is, I know it's kind of hard to see. D so down there, that game has like a sewer level. And the sewer level is, um, there's sort of like water in the middle and there's two sides to the water and there's some bridges and there's some like ladders into the water. And that's sort of a level modeled after that. Um, and you can see all of the little doors and they all have like numbers next to them, like 32, 33, 27. And that game sort of had dungeons that had around 10 doors that might lead to other doors. I decided to just make maze-like dungeons that had like 30, 40 doors that all led to each other. You know, I was a real asshole. Um, this is a level modeled after the volcano level in Earthbound, uh, the Fire Spring. And that level had sort of multiple uh, sort of steps going up to the top of the volcano as well as lava that flowed down to impede your path and there are various ladders. And so this is like... This is basically a maze where the red things block your way, the brown things are ladders that go up and down, and all of the doors have a letter next to them, you know, T-U-V-W-X-Y, that just leads to the corresponding door. And then up here is all the indoor sections that are inside the volcano. Um, and yeah, there's some kind of food stain on there. No idea what that is. Um, our Prismata platformer level is going to be introduced soon. Like, I have a long history with platformers. I, I made immense numbers of platformers and platformer levels. I'm not going to show them off today, but I can show off some of them uh, in a future video. Uh, later on, I started playing more RPGs. Like, I played uh, games like Zelda and Chrono Trigger. Uh, I mean, Earthbound, I guess, is sort of an RPG. Um... And so this is like a design of, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but there's, there's clearly you were supposed to be a witch and there is a witch's castle and there's like a learn to use your wand here, learn to use your broom here, the boss is here, uh, workers only lunchroom, like there clearly was some plot line here, um, there's a, there's a corner store there, um, and I, you know, I, I had the sense to include sort of all of the elements that you would go through as you were playing the game. And then this this must have been the dungeon, uh, which is enormous. And it has, it looks like slides and ladders. I don't know, it, it just looks like a giant friggin' maze. Um, I, I really have no idea. They, they look like water slides. Maybe there's a pool at the bottom? I can't tell. Um, I, I remember as a kid, I used to go to swimming lessons and I loved going down the water slides. So it. Those types of inspirations likely made it into the designs. Um, and, okay, here's the last one, the last thing I'm going to show you. Um, this is some kind of school project, and I am trying to figure out how old I was. But uh, it says 1995, so I would have been like, um, I guess, 7, 8 years old. I was born in 87, so probably 7 years old. Uh, and the assignment was, okay, I'll tell you the assignment. The assignment was, think of three things that you do right now, and think of how you used to do them in the past, and how you're gonna do them in the future. So it's past, present, future, three things. Um, and it's... I'll have to pull the camera back. Maybe I can just tilt it back up here. Um, and show it to you this way. So, yeah, at the top it says, Interests Can Change, by Elliot Brown. Okay. Um... And let's see. Okay, so yeah, in the past, over here, I did rolling pennies. In the present, I did collecting interest on my money. And in the future, over here, being a millionaire. And there's me standing on a diving board, about to dive into a swimming pool of money, Scrooge McDuck style. Okay. And then the middle one, in the past, is me doing a 24-piece puzzle. So that's like for little kids. The middle is me doing a 1,000-piece puzzle. And on the right is me owning a puzzle factory. <laughs> okay. 
And here's the bottom one. The bottom one is me at age three playing with ropes. Me at age seven playing video games. And me at age 30 uh, making my own video games. Okay, so, so there it is. Actually, the, the collecting interest at 7 is a funny story, because the Super Nintendo came out in, I think, 1990 or whatever, and 1991, like, I wanted one so bad because my cousin had one. And my mom was like, it's too expensive, it's $186 or whatever, it's $179.99 which was how much a SNES cost back in those days, right? Seems like nothing compared to the, the, the modern Xbox or whatever. But um, I would go around asking my mom and dad for like spare change every day. And you know, my dad would just like unload his pockets and give me all his quarters and dimes. And if I was lucky, uh, you know, we live in Canada, so we had $1 coins and, and they didn't have the $2 coins back then. But it, I would get $1 coins and I would be super excited. Uh, and I rolled all the money, right? So that's, that's what it says in there, rolling pennies or whatever. Um, and I had all these rollers of pennies and nickels and dimes, and my, my parents obviously encouraged it. They wanted me to like learn the value of saving up money and stuff like that. Um, and we deposit the, deposited it all into a bank account, and my mom showed me the like bank statement or the little bank book, uh, and it showed $56 or something. I was like, yes, yes, I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna get there. I just need to keep doing this for a few more months. And so I did it for a few more months, and I remember the second time she deposited it all, I was at $120. And I was like, yeah, I'm like more than halfway there, this is great. And then, um, and then I think sometime later that year, I did, the, I did the third deposit, and my mom showed me it was like $186. And I was like, yes, it's above $179.99, now I can go get my Super Nintendo. And then my parents bought it for me as a Christmas gift. And like, I felt like all of these months of work, saving up cash, had been like, for nothing. Because <laughs> I just like got it from Santa Claus or something like that. And I like, I was so happy that I had it, but at the same time, I felt that all of this effort had been in vain. And it like, it pissed me off. Um, and, but my mom said, no, 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 leave it in the bank and it will generate interest. And when you look back later, it'll be even larger. And you could, like, save it up or go to college or something like that. And I was like, okay, now I have a bank account, I guess, and I have money in it. Um, and she, she would not let me take out the money to buy games. <laughs> it was very clear that I couldn't do anything I wanted with that money. It was really, like, my savings account, and I wasn't allowed to touch it. Um... But yeah, when I was a kid, my life basically just revolved around video games. And I, like, later I got into math and programming and did math contests and stuff like that. Um, but sort of from the ages of, like, you know, three years old to, like, seven or eight years old, video games were the thing that I loved the most and the thing that I wanted to do the most. Um, and so, like, my sensibilities regarding game design were very much inherited from the games I played at the time. Like, I played a lot of, say, the Donkey Kong Country series, and those games have a very specific way of introducing mechanics. You know, there'll be a new mechanic in the level, and they'll show it to you in a safe environment, and then they'll give you increasingly challenging uh, situations in which you have to exhibit mastery of that mechanic in order to beat the level. And that sort of pattern uh, of repeatedly increasing difficulty situations um, it did start making its way into sort of the, the stuff I was designing in my spare time. And I learned basic game design mechanics from just like playing a lot of games and writing stuff on paper. Now, I never had any play testers. I never had people to try this shit and tell me it's too hard or it sucks or, you know. Uh, so, so no feedback was, was obtained. And it's hard to learn when you're not getting feedback. But, you know, this is how I got started as a kid. Um, Warcraft 3 custom maps. I did get into map making for... Um, I did a bit of Warcraft 1 map, ma map making and a lot of StarCraft map making. That would have been a bit later in my career. Um, the next time I do one of these shows, I'm going to show off some of my earliest video games. I didn't really get... Like, I had a computer as a kid, but I never really programmed, or I, I never really had anybody who could teach me how to program. Like, the person in my family who knew the most about the computer was actually my grandma. And she showed me how to install stuff and put the floppy disk in and type, you know, DIR and the MS-DOS commands and, and run the games. Uh, 
but I, I didn't really get into programming until I was about 11 years old. It was grade seven when I remember doing it. Um, and that was when I started making computer video games, which I will talk about next time. Um, but anyways, that's it for the show and tell. Um, I guess the moral of the story is, you know, if you, if you know young people and they have an interest in video games, uh, I think encouraging that is very important. And I think especially with young kids in video games, it's very important to give them video games that are about mastery of mechanics, about learning things, about getting better at the game, rather than being about just grinding for hours or stuff like that. Um, because it teaches them to have that sort of sensibility of, of like, you know, the reward is myself improving rather than the reward is just like grinding for long enough to get something. Um, and I see a lot of games these days, like, they don't necessarily have those traditional aesthetics or sensibilities. In many cases, they're a lot easier. Um, and it's not necessarily that easy games are bad, but it's just like having challenges to overcome, I think is very important. And I think encouraging kids to play video games lots so that they can improve themselves and get over those challenges is really good for uh, them developing. And I think, you know, imagine if I had had Mario Maker when I was a kid. I just would have gone ham with that shit. Um, I actually did have a, a piece of software called Mario Paint, which I didn't pull up, but I will right now. Um, Mario Paint was a really weird piece of software. Um, it was a kind of text-based... Um, like, it, it had text, it had uh, stamps, and it had, like, paintbrushes, and it had a music maker in it. I, everybody talks about the music maker, but I actually used it... I don't, I don't know if I could find any actual drawings. Like, a lot of people made drawings in it, but it, it here's, here's a good image. It had these stamps in the game. And so I would like create little levels out of the stamps and you could actually make your own stamps. And I kind of created my own tile sets and used them to create levels of different varieties and genres. And I was probably eight, nine, 10 years old when I did that. Um, and, and I remember they looked really friggin' ugly. I wasn't good at pixel art or anything like that. Um, but those were sort of the tools of the time. And nowadays kids have stuff like Mario Maker, which I think is like a, a great, brilliant, uh, ingenious piece of software that everybody should use. Um, Earthbound is a game about skill development. Earthbound was a really weird game. Um, I I definitely was a bit older when I played that game, and I I like the game. It's a good game, but yeah, it's not about. It's it's weird. It basically like if you get multi bottle rockets, you can beat all the bosses in a few hits, and the game becomes really easy. I don't think I knew that as a kid. I definitely felt like I was strategizing to beat the battles, but I don't know. I remember grinding for hours to try and get the Sword of Kings, which is one of the character's ultimate weapon, and it, there was literally like a 1 in 128 drop rate uh, that you had to fight the Super Starman or the Starman Super over and over and over again to get the Sword of Kings, and I just remember it being such a grind, and that was when I decided, like, you know, fuck grinding. It, it was the, the Sword of Kings and the Starman Super from Earthbound that made me decide that grinding was a pain in the ass and I never wanted to do it. And I remember when, like, I finally got it, I was, like, so happy, but then I just realized, oh, now what? Like, okay, I have it. I don't even care. <laughs> Training for D2. Yeah, like, I played the original Diablo, Diablo 1, quite a bit, um, but I would just run through the game over and over again. I never played the end game or the multiplayer. Um, you know, I would just play normal runs over and over and over again with the different classes. Um, and I never really got deep into D2. Grinding for drops? Nah, that's just not for me. It's not my style. Anyways, I'm going to open up uh, to completely open Q&A. So if anybody has any questions for me about anything relating to learning to design games or Prismata or just anything in general, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, wow. I, I honestly never got into WoW. Like... I can see the appeal for some people, but when I played games, it was never about, like, exploring another world or, or like, living that fantasy of being a character. I was always a gameplay and mechanics-focused player. Like, you know, I cared about uh, mastering, you know, movement and combat mechanics for the most part. Uh, are there skin sets stored up to keep the hype combo counter going after release? Um, here's the thing. We thought about doing a lot of skin sets for release, and we kind of realized that, like, um, the only people who care about skin sets are the players who already sort of have a lot of the existing skins. 
Um, and for the other sort of 99% of new players, or at least we hope it's 99% of new players, um, I don't think they're going to be that hyped about skin sets. So I think the time when we can maximize the hype from unloading new skin sets is not like one month after launch. It's probably going to be like five, six months after launch or Halloween or Christmas. Um, so our plan is to focus the post-launch updates around single player campaign content, which is what we think the new players are going to be interested in. And not about cosmetics, emotes, uh, skins yet. Um, kind of muted for a while. Looks like your parents really encouraged the nerdy. How much credit do they get for Prismata? Um, I mean, I think who I am is a function of my upbringing. Um, I, I remember being very young and my mom, um, she used to work as a stage director in theater. And she stayed at home to raise me for a number of years, and then my brother, and then my sister. Um, and she would spend so much time with me, like, teaching me math, and teaching me um, just anything I wanted to learn. And she bought me all kinds of things, like, you know those, like, little math toys and games you get for kids? Like, I had dominoes, and flashcards, and stupid little board games. And she just, like, spent all day doing that shit with me. Um, and... You know, I think it's the reason why later I had success at math contests. I was just like, you know, years ahead of my peers in school. Um, I attribute a lot of that to the time she spent with me uh, when I was very young. Um, and, and like, you know, like there's nothing that can really quantify the value of the impact that that has had on me throughout the entire remainder of my life. Um, and, you know, like... I think there is some function of it that's genetic. I mean, I think a lot of children would not be able to sit there for hours and hours doing math the way I did. Um, I had some kind of predisposition to being very patient and to trying really hard on things. Um, but she put in the time. And I, I definitely credit that to me being the way I am now. And, and I think, you know, encouraging the nerdy. Like, my parents bought me all kinds of nerdy stuff and they encouraged the video games like they they wanted me to get outside and play they didn't want me to just like loaf around spending that stuff spending all day on that stuff um and they didn't really buy me like excessively violent stuff like i do remember playing doom and duke nukem when i was probably nine ten years old um you know but like they they weren't worried about that they were mostly just worried that like you know i i wasn't turning into some like Degen who was never going to go out and do other things. So they also, like, I did swimming lessons. I did, um, I remember doing, like, some kind of gym, gymnastic thing. Uh, I don't know. I, I played hockey. I mean, I'm Canadian, so everybody plays hockey, but I played hockey. I played soccer. Like, you know, they did all kinds of things, but the video games was the one thing that I just, like, wanted to do all the time. Um, let me scroll up. Uh, did I have any formal game design training? Like, okay, the existence of university, say, undergraduate programs in game development or game design, that did not happen until very recently. Like, I remember the DigiPen Institute of Technology was kind of the first one that was out there, and I remember them advertising in Nintendo Power or something, probably in the late 90s, early 2000s, maybe, or, or probably, probably after 2000. Um, and, like... That was kind of when it was just getting started, and it wasn't something that I was considering for undergraduate. Like, I, I did math, I did math olympiads, I did CS, and I thought, okay, I just go into math and CS. And I never really considered video games as, like, th there was a portion of my life where it definitely wasn't what I was going to end up doing. I thought I would be a math prof, or I thought I would be doing some kind of software development or CS research. Um, but... You know, nowadays, I would say for people interested in getting into video games who just want to work on them, I think those are now becoming a decent option. But for me, no, I never had any formal game design, game development training at all. I do have a degree in computer science, which I think is certainly, um, it is the right type of formal training if, you, training if you want to, say, do computer graphics programming or computer engine programming or something like that. In terms of stuff like level design and puzzle design, um, I don't know of any program out there that teaches people to, desi to design puzzles in the way that I would consider is the proper way to design puzzles. I do not know of such a thing existing. I think that game design schools, um, they teach very basic things about sort of level design and about art, and they, they teach you sort of the standard pipeline of tools that's used in a lot of AAA games. Um, you know, I learned more from reading books about how to design puzzles than I did 
you know, than I could ever see learning from a course. But I don't know, maybe there are courses that exist. But to me, that knowledge seems to be kind of contained uh, amongst a small group of people and is, is mostly learned by doing rather than learned by, you know, reading or from a class. Um, sorry, I know I'm way behind on the questions. I'm scrolling down pretty slowly. Um... What have been getting done lately with regards to Prismata's release? Oh my god. So many things. Um, working on the campaign, working on just fixing bugs. Um, we're doing a lot of sort of small modifications to the script. Tons of PR stuff like getting uh, uh, like sponsorships ready for the launch. Uh, news stuff for, for Games Press. Um, like... I'm now working with two PR companies, one of which is, is doing sort of uh, traditional games media and the other is doing uh, influencer stuff. Um, get stuff fixed up for sound. Um, you know, we, we did a bunch of revamps of combat training last week. Like, I, I'm working probably 14, 15 hours a day, including weekends on this thing. Like, it's not going to stop until the game launches. Uh, the list of things to do is, is, like, so high and the amount of time is so low. Um, it's pretty insane. Um, how do you keep yourself on task and productive when you're working by myself? I've never really had an issue with that. Um, I just go, 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 and take breaks when I need to. Uh, I, I don't like spend a lot of time like playing video games or watching YouTube or something like that. Like, and and when I do, it's usually you know I chill out for a half hour, or grab something to eat. Um, you know, but I I have stuff I need to get done all the time, and it's just like. I don't know. I've never been a person who has fallen victim to wasting a lot of time. Um, I've fallen victim to being unmotivated to do something. But right now I'm like so motivated to do all these tasks and get everything done that like, uh, you know, getting off topic or, or wasting time is not really an issue for me right now. Um, it's cool to see the stuff you drew as a kid. It took me back to my own childhood. Like, I honestly think there's, there's so many people who do this as a kid and they're they're really captivated by it um and it just doesn't go anywhere for them or not they're not given the outlets to be able to continue developing their creativity and their skills and i think that like nowadays you got shit like game maker or or even you know construct 2 or construct 3 now i guess um where it's so easy for people even with zero programming knowledge to go in and like make something cool and i think that providing access to that for kids like if I'd had that when I was a kid holy crap you wouldn't have been able to tear me away from it and I probably would have made some you know terrible things that slowly got better over, over time right um turnip sapiens for me the appeal of the skins I want to have all the units have the same skin set either the blue skins or the baking cake ones I mean we're definitely not going to make, say, like, baking skins for every single unit in Prismata. That's probably... that's just too much work, and it's also unsustainable as we release new units. Um, you know, we try to have them in sets so that you can collect the whole set, but it's never been our goal to have a style and cover all the units. I, I just don't think it's reasonable. I mean, already what we're doing with skins is, like, more than most other games do. A lot of other games just have, like... You know, for League of Legends, for example, they'll just have, like, five different skins for this one unit, and they don't even really have themes. Um, I, I like the themes. I think it also decreases the cost of, of doing the skin sets because you can kind of develop a set of ideas that go within a theme, and then you can apply them to the units, and then you can draw them all in the same style. I, I think it's a better way of doing skins for something like Prismata, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't want to change that. Um, do, 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 do. Have we ever thought about Prismata bosses? Uh, there is a campaign coming up. It may or may not have bosses. I mean, like, it's hard to make a sort of boss character in Prismata because it's really weird to be fighting, like, one unit that, say, has a ton of HP and just, just like, does stuff. Um, but we do have some boss fights where it's kind of like a high HP fragile unit that does a different thing every turn. Um, we do have some levels that are like that. There's a big variety of different levels, and some of the sort of boss stages, um, it might be sort of, oh my god, you're fighting three of these things that each spawn other things. Like, uh, there's a lot of variety there, and I think you guys will like it. Um, do any sports now? Uh, I play DDR. Does that count? Uh, that's, that's basically my way of not doing no exercise, <laughs> is to play some DDR. Uh, and, and this month I haven't been getting much in at all. Um, but I, I still keep up with DDR. I actually used to play Ultimate Frisbee when I was at MIT. 
Um, I was technically on the MIT Ultimate Frisbee team. I mean, I was probably the worst player on the team, um, but I, I did actually play in games for MIT against other schools. Um, I mean, I, I know how to throw and catch a disc, and I can run, but, you know, I, I sucked. I sucked. There were people on there who were, like, so incredibly athletic and could jump, like, 12 feet in the air, and, you know. Um, but th that was sort of just for fun. Um, what was the plan after launch in terms of continued support, maintenance, and development of other games? Um, so the launch that's coming this month is a Steam Early Access launch. We are, we are starting Steam Early Access. We are going to continue developing Prismata and ideally later this year bring it out of Early Access and make it um, just a available to everyone. Um, we're going to be having a few more chapters of single player content. If that stuff sells well, then we'll do more of it. Uh, I'm very happy to keep creating single player content. Um, the content creation is not the expensive part. It's all of the tutorials and shit that we've done that's that's really the time consuming part. Um, so more content creation is definitely going to happen. More units, definitely going to happen. New units adding to Prismata is like, the, the costliest thing is actually just balancing them and, and sort of testing them and making sure they're not completely broken and doing the post-launch balance updates as needed in the stats. Um, the art is very simple to do. The actual initial design of a new unit, we have 10 pages of unit designs. Um, we're never going to run out anytime soon. It's just deciding which one we want to do next and then playtesting it a lot. So new units are going to happen. Um, I don't know for how long, I don't know for many years. I definitely do want to start working on new games. Um, at the same time, you know, if, if Prismata is going well, if we're still growing the game and new players are getting into it and it's large and it's making money, then we're going to keep, uh, you know, pouring development effort into the game as, as long as we want to. Um, I don't intend to stop doing it anytime soon. But, you know, I have my backlog of the 10 other games that I want to make too, so I, I have to balance it against them both. Um, Blue Globe skins are pretty sweet. I will eventually get to the bottom of the chat. I mean, unless you guys just, like, start chatting more and more. Um, you love the googly eye skins. Is raids happening? So, okay, let me tell you about raids. Um, I like the idea of raids. We do have a prototype of them that was made many, many years ago. Uh, I guess, in theory, it still works, although maybe the code has changed enough that we might have to tweak them to get them working again. Um, there is a large amount of design effort required to make raids into a high-quality, long-lasting product that sort of, you know, has an end game and isn't just, oh, it's a cute little thing you can do once. Um, the main person behind raids was Alex Weiss. He, um, I mean, he's still around, but, like, he's in Thailand now working on some cryptocurrency startup. Um, he has expressed some interest in, like, maybe doing raids. Uh, but that's going to depend on what happens with his life. It's going to ha depend on what happens with Prismata launching. Um, you know, without him, would I want to do raids on my own? I mean, maybe if it's the number one thing that the community requests. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to see how the launch goes. We're going to have to see whether people want raids or they want more single player content or they just want more units and skins. Um, you know, I'm very open to being convinced that raids are the thing we positively absolutely have to do. You know, maybe we should do single player raids. Maybe we shouldn't do multiplayer raids. Maybe we should have like a, a dungeon run mode, you know, like what Hearthstone or Slay the Spire has. You know, there's, there's a lot of different things we can do within the uh, sort of rule set of Prismata. And I am looking for suggestions uh, and I'm open to anything. Uh, but the idea of raids themselves is, is like, you know, it's dependent on what happens. That's all I can really say. Uh, everyone in the chat's arguing about what skin sets are the best. Uh, you don't get why so many games feel the need for bosses. They're often the worst part of the game. Um, do I agree with that sentiment? I really like bosses in a lot of the games I played as a kid. Um, I mean, like I, I remember just playing Zelda or... or uh, you know, like like Zelda games, the boss fights are mostly pretty cool. Um, it might be the case that bosses are sort of more expensive to develop than the value they generate. But in Prismata, a boss fight is basically just another battle, except maybe you, you have a special set of rules. And that special set of rules is not difficult to create. And I kind of just lump it in to the category of like, oh, it's, it's just another Prismata level, except, you know, maybe we're going to do some unusual trigger or something like that. And to be honest, I want all of 
the Prismata levels to be interesting and have special rules and triggers. Like if you play sort of the StarCraft II campaigns, say, you know, in any of the three games, um, they all have very unique and interesting levels. And there's no, like, boss level, for example. Um, it's sort of just that every level is interesting, and some of them may uh, represent a climax or sort of a mini-climax in the progression of the game's story um, and act in the place of a boss fight. But there's, there's no, like, boss fight, so to say. So, like, how you even define boss fight is kind of arbitrary, I guess. Like, in my mind, I consider, you know, the eighth mission of Chapter 1 to be the boss fight. But it's like, you know, is it really a boss? Like, is there anything that kind of quant quantifiably says that this is a boss and the other ones are not? Not really. Um, do -do 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 -do. What's my opinion of 307's betting system to eliminate player advantage? So, we thought of a lot of different sort of betting and auction systems that would address the sort of player 1, player 2 choice issue. Um, and a game that Shalev and I used to play a lot is this game called, called Hex. Um, not the Hex trading card game, but uh, it's a game that John Nash played a lot. It's sort of like you, you put black and white stones on a hexagonal grid board and you have to connect a path with them. Uh, the Hex board game. And that game uses a pie rule where it's sort of like one person plays the first move and the next person decides whether or not they want to swap. Um, and like we thought of all kinds of different pie rule based systems or auction based systems for choosing player one and player two. Like we even thought of like what if the timer was involved, you know, you had auction based on time, you know, I'll take pay player two, but I get less time. Um, and all of those ideas that sort of involve a pre-game phase where before you get to gameplay, you have to go through this other phase of like deciding who's player one and who player two and what the stakes are. Um, we kind of thought that those ideas should be reserved for tournament play only. Or if we did eSports or we did some high-level league or something like that, um, then it might make sense. But for casual ladder play, uh, to add an additional phase of the game, it felt unnecessary in terms of the amount of value or strategy that it added. Like, because basically once you add that, then quantifying how much a set is player one or player two favored becomes a skill that you need to be good at. Like, you need to be able to read a set and determine if it's player one or player two favored. And, like, we didn't necessarily feel that that was a skill that we wanted to be in Prismata. We wanted Prismata to be about playing the set as best you can and sort of determining what the best strategy is. Uh, if then you also have to be good at, like, guessing which side is better, um, you know, it, it felt like it distracted from the kind of primary meaning or message that we wanted, which was that Prismata is a game about deep strategy and about thinking the, the deepest about the strategy. Um, so I don't know. It just didn't feel right. Um, and I am willing to revisit that decision in the future if people think that increasing the balance between player one and player two is of high priority and high enough to justify the cost of adding a new phase to the game that would take extra time and sort of pull you out of the game. Um, but we, we kind of thought that it would only be something that high-level players would want or need, and, and sort of high-level tournaments or something like that would be the place where we would try that out. Um, but I don't know. I, I could talk for a long time about sort of the different systems and their merits versus drawbacks, um, but I don't know. We'll do that another time. Where did the core of Prismata come from? Um, the shared unit sets is from a tabletop card game called Dominion. Uh, it's a deck building game where uh, it, it's it's mostly about uh, building resources and kind of uh, comboing different cards, building engines out of cards to allow you to economically dominate your opponent and sort of buy all the good stuff before they can. Um, Dominion was a game we played a lot sort of in 2010, the year when we started working on Prismata. Um, and beyond that, it was just RTS, Magic the Gathering, and sort of the chess-like, uh, perfect information, turn-based, uh, you know, no hidden information, no randomness uh, type of gameplay. Zelda bosses are good. I agree. Um, is it better for us to buy Prismata on Steam to up the hype or purchase a backer tier? Um, people keep asking me this. Um... I don't have a strong preference. If you want to get this game on Steam, get it on Steam. If you want to buy it from our site, get it on our site. Um, if you buy it from Steam, then Steam takes uh, some royalty or some cut, um, you know, and, and uh, if you buy it on our site, we get everything. Um, that said, like, the, the difference is not an amount that 
is going to make or break Lunark Studios or that we care about. Um, and if you play on Steam, then especially if you have friends on Steam, then oftentimes the community can actually encourage further sales of the game. If you're creating those little pop-ups that says, you know, so-and-so is playing Prismata in your friend's feed, then those can really help us. If you have a lot of Steam friends, then by all means, get the game on Steam. Um, if you want to say, write a good review for us, then please get the game on Steam and leave us a nice review. Um, that would be great. And I, I honestly would value a, a positive review on Steam much higher than I would value the, you know, small number of extra dollars that we might get if you bought it on our site instead due to Steam not taking a cut. Um, so, you know, it's it's not important. Like, do what you want to do. Um, will the base Prismata unit set ever change? We've thought about that. Um, you know, I think one of our events is an alternate base set. Um, it's hard to say. If we did that, it would be a, a monumental, you know, like, hey guys, it's Prismata Season 2. Like, it, it would be something big and special to justify that large of a change. Um, you know, and, and like, our campaign right now uses the original base set. How would we deal with that? How would we deal with the fact that we've balanced every unit of the game around a base set? Uh, it's hard to see that happening without it, like, being a major project. Uh, and it's unclear whether that'd even be a strong benefit. Like, yes, it would bring some new gameplay to the table, but at the same time, uh, it could screw up a lot of things too. It's not necessarily going to be better. Um, the current base set was chosen after testing hundreds, literally, of different base sets to find the one that we thought was the best. So um, it's very hard for me to see a different base set being an improvement at this point in time, at least. Um... Still more discussion about bosses. Action games having great bosses. Puzzle and strat like puzzle and strategy games. I yeah, I kind of agree. They don't have a great record with bosses. Like I remember Heart of the Swarm had some bosses that you sort of had to fight as Kerrigan, and none of them were really memorable or good. Um so I don't know. Thought about uh releasing statistics yet? Um we will release some statistics in the future. I'm not sure what or when, um, but you know, I, I'm happy to release stats. I just don't want people to start arguing over stuff. Um, so, you know, we, we might not release an entire database of all the stats of every unit ever, but we, we can release some stats. I think they make for good blog posts and sort of interesting things to talk about. Um, this plan after launch in terms of continued support, maintenance, and development of the games. I did kind of answer that already. We're going to be doing a lot of post-launch updates. If Prismata goes really well, we'll continue developing more content for it. If it doesn't, we're going to move on to other games. Um, you know, and we'll probably be working on another game while we're doing Prismata updates. Like, I think there's no universe in which I'm not going to develop another game. Um, but it, it's mostly just how much effort we put onto maintaining Prismata after the launch. Um... Uh, consider player one, player two bidding for tournaments. Um, we want ladder play to be identical for tournament play. It would be more like, say we had a Grandmaster League or something, which was like, okay, the top two, 200 players are now in the Grandmaster League and they use Vendium Scrap, or they now use some kind of bidding system. Like, it would be something like that. Um, and then that would extend to tournaments. Um, you know, but that's, that's sort of something that we've decided not to do for now and would consider in the future. Like, if Prismata is going to become a really big esports game, then um, there's this question that comes up is, is the game balanced enough to be fair for esports? Um, and I mean, if you look at some of the other esports that are full of randomness, then uh, that question seems kind of silly. But at the same time, um, I think esports audiences are more tolerant of a person getting unlucky than a person sort of getting screwed by the, you know, the set that was pulled. Um, so it might be the case that we actually do want to have a more fair and balanced set of rules for tournaments. At the same time, like, I think our given rules are already really, really good and that it's hard to complain. Uh, there always will be complainers, but we're pretty comfortable with how things are going right now. Um, keep filling chat so stream continues. My voice is getting a little uh, hoarse. I may be uh, cutting it off relatively soon. So if you have any last minute questions, get them in. Um, can you have a stats page after every level that shows on average? Oh, like the histograms in, in Zactronics games? Um, like, we thought about histograms. I think Prismata is kind of the wrong game for that because, like, it's not that clear what you want to optimize. Many of the missions, like some of the hard versions of the missions have a unique solution. So it's kind of stupid to optimize. Um, 
and sometimes you don't have that much freedom. Uh, like, we have had some specific missions where people have been like, Oh, can you beat Velkar in 13 turns? Oh, you can? Okay, how much damage can you have left over if you want to beat Velkar in 13 turns? And people have actually tried to optimize a mission as much as possible. Uh, but we think that's sort of for the room of, uh, like, expert challenges and some achievements. There's some achievements related to that stuff, rather than having zectronic style histograms. I don't think Prismata is the right game for it. I do think there could be some other types of games that have those types of things. Like, especially if we get to raids or sort of single player dungeon runs, something like that. Concept in mind for Lunark's next game. Every game developer has a list, either in the back of their head or physically written down, of all their ideas for games they want to work on. Uh, I am no different. I have dozens of ideas. Uh, some of them much more fleshed out than others. Um, and what Lunark works on next will depend on, you know, who's going to be involved in the project and what we feel like doing. Um, it, it may be the case that my next game is not a Lunark game. If Prismata flops, then, you know, I, I'll be working on my own or I could be looking to work with a different team. Who knows? Uh, I'm assuming Prismata is going to do fairly well and will at least do enough, do well enough to keep the studio going and, and sort of to, to, to keep a few devs uh, available for working on new projects. So um, we'll see. Um, how do you approach difficulty adjustment and appealing to casual players? Yeah, campaign is kind of hard for that. Um, the way it works is the campaign's really easy. Uh, existing players will not lose on a single level, uh, at least in sort of the first chapter. Um, and then all of the campaign levels have an expert version, which is hard. And, uh... The vast majority of them will be hard, even for players who are currently good at Prismata. And it's not because they're they're like you know crazy master bot with handicaps or something like that. It's more because they are puzzle-like challenges where being good at Prismata on the ladder is not necessarily going to make these challenges any easier for you. I mean, they they may make it a little bit faster to find the right set of moves, but you're still going to have to uh, discover things and learn things about a given scenario in order to be able to pass those puzzle challenges. So uh, there's definitely enough content there that we think the experienced players will be happy, and I think the tutorials, which is sort of the first eight levels uh, on the normal difficulty, I think that will... Like, we have done a lot of testing with dozens and dozens of new players who have never played Prismata before to try and adjust that difficulty level of those initial missions so that everybody's able to get through. Uh, and we think we succeeded at that. I mean, that's why we're releasing the product, is because we think it's good enough that we can get it out there and that people will be able to learn the game. There's also like 40, probably even more than 40 now, combat training levels, which uh, we've been revamping to try and make them also more accessible and, and have a natural progression that people can go through as they learn the game that isn't going to stump people as much as sort of the old tutorials did. So we think we've improved immensely in that regard. And in fact, the fact that we have improved those levels is why we are releasing the game now, essentially. Um, how do you make normal mode easy enough and head scratchy enough at the same time? Um, so we sort of have a goal difficulty curve in mind. Like, we want the first three missions to be stuff that people beat, but they, like, um, have some extra challenge in somehow. Like, the second mission, for example, has a bonus objective, which is sort of beat it fast. And uh, so many players will just ignore it and they'll get through it, but players who kind of are into optimization will realize suddenly, okay, there's, there's something a little bit meaty here, there's something I can try and do well at. Um, mission three uh, is the first mission where people's people feel a bit anxious. They feel like they could lose. They feel like they're going to get owned. Um, and in fact, very few people lose Mission 3, but they feel a bit of stress or tension or anxiety. And so we try and balance the sort of flow curve where people get, you know, at, at first they're very anxious because they're learning the rules. They don't know what's going on. Then they get into a nice rhythm. Then we throw the game's economy at them. And then they're like, oh no, there's more rules. Then they sort of get it and get into a rhythm. And then they start getting hammered by the enemy, right? And then, and then again, they have to learn how to defend. Um, and mission four is, is the mission where you kind of get to build up from scratch. And like, that's kind of when it, when it clicks for people. Um, but many people lose on mission four, right? Um, and we actually rigged mission four. <laughs> Okay, where the amount of enemies that spawn on that mission, it's, it's kind of a, a mission where the, the enemies just like spawn and attack you. Um, the quantity that spawn depends on how well you're doing. 
So if you're doing really well and you have a huge economy, uh, you're going to get hammered. There's going to be tons of these things attacking you. Um, whereas if you're doing poorly, it's a bit more gentle. And I've had players who are strong Prismata players doing the testing and say, that mission's way too hard, man. How the hell are people going to beat that? And they don't realize that, no, it's hard for you because we rigged it. Um, and there's very few missions where we've done that type of thing. But in some cases, it's necessary. Just because Prismata is like an exponential growth game, right? So if you, if you grow too slowly during the early turns, you can get so far behind. Um... The first mission where you fight against a bot, kind of in a, in a 1v1 scenario, that mission was hard to balance too. We had to adjust the difficulty and sort of the starting level. We, we actually wanted the bot to be fairly competent. We didn't want you to be playing against a bot that made stupid moves because we found that if we did that, then the player would copy those stupid moves. We wanted, for example, the bot to always defend optimally because we wanted the player to be able to watch the bot and learn from how the bot defends in order to defend optimally. Um, so those are challenging and it's mostly just like test over and over again with new players and try and hit that perfect sweet spot in terms of, you know, they don't lose 10 times. They maybe lose once or, or they maybe get it on their first try, but they barely got it and they almost lost, right? We, we really want those experiences and we discover if people like almost lose or they, um, like they lose, but then they try again and they win. They feel so happy when they win. It's so excited, right? So it's very important for us to hit that, right? It's just testing, though. Um, how do they compare to Impending Doom? Uh, nothing we've ever published compares to Impending Doom. Impending Doom is such an unreasonably unfair and difficult single-player challenge. Like, I, I don't know if you guys heard this. I think Shalev spent, like, more than 15 hours trying to beat it or something insane like that. Um, you know, it, it took me probably, like, five, six, seven hours uh, impending doom is is of unreasonable difficulty. We we understand that there's some people that like those types of puzzles, and we do have some. Um, let's see, what can I say without spoiling anything? Um, there is ultra hard content. Just don't worry about it. Okay, don't worry about it. Um, do, 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 do. Have I competed in any programming contests? Um, I got a gold medal in the Canadian Computing Competition, which is our national high school programming contest. Um, I didn't do IOI. Um, I did the USA Computing Olympiad. I, I went to their international finals that one year. Like, basically, I didn't do a lot of it. Um, I was at a winter training camp for math contests in my grade 12 year, which is final year of high school. And... That was in like January of that year. And my friend said, hey, you should try programming contests. And I'm like, oh, okay. How do I learn to get good at these? And he said, go to the USACO website and do their the problems on their programming gateway. Uh, and just like do a hundred of them. And I was like, okay. So I went there and I practiced those for like two or three months. And then I did the Canadian computing competition, which is a two round contest. So I did the first round and then the second round was a couple of months later. Um, but basically those six months were really the only months of my life where I did programming contest. After that, like I know there's ACM, ICPC and, um, you know, stuff like top coder. I found it too boring. I found that I would read the problem and then I would think about the solution on paper. And once I found out what the optimal algorithm was, I just like didn't want to code it. And I didn't want to be bothered like debugging or testing and, you know, submitting the code. Like I was very happy to just like solve it in my head or solve it on paper and that continues to this day like every time the ioi comes out i always read the problems i always try to solve them but i never code them up because i i'm just not interested in programming i guess or, or not interested in typing out the code i'm more interested in the deep underlying informatics ideas uh which many of those problems have very beautiful ideas but it, it's just like you know i don't care to code them up i don't care to have like a giant book code of data structures and stuff like that um do, 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 do. Rigging missions. Is it possible to win by sandbagging? Uh, I would say that it doesn't really help. Like, the way the rigging in the missions works is it looks at how much stuff you have and then spawns an amount of units so that you could just barely beat it, let's say. Um, so if you sandbag, you'll be able to just barely beat it, and if you get lots of stuff, you'll be able to just barely beat it. I think the function of difficulty as a function of how much stuff you get, um, like... I think it's actually slightly negative, so if you get more stuff, it might be slightly easier, but not a lot easier, but you definitely can't improve your odds by sandbagging. Um, 
There was a recent player who kept feeling like he was one damage short because he was playing poorly because the bot was defending for plus one any turn. Um, I'm not sure who you're talking about. Like, we've tested our missions on top players, and we've had, like, good experienced players tell us that, oh, I think this mission's impossible, guys. And I'm like, nope, it's not. You just haven't found the solution yet. Like, they people definitely get stumped. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Ben also went to Yuseiko. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I was 2005. 2005 Yuseiko. It was in Colorado Springs. Is it there always? It might be always there. Um, dip, dip, dip. Um, where would the difficulty of the ultra hard content be in comparison to the expert challenges of Masterbot? Um, I think. Like, say you go into the, um, how shall I say, the current combat training has some puzzles, like say the Thunder Deemer puzzle. Um, we have several that I think are harder than that, uh, significantly harder. Um, beating Masterbot is kind of not really comparable, because I think getting good at Prismata such that you can beat Masterbot is somewhat orthogonal to being able to solve a Prismata puzzle. I, the skills are quite different, and I think the people who are good at the former, which is beating Masterbot, may still struggle with uh, the expert challenges. We we found, you know, people can crush Masterbot, and nope, they're still stumped. 20-30 minutes, an hour on one puzzle. Um, so, you know, it, it should provide a challenge. Why was Impending Doom removed from the game? <laughs> it was removed from the game because we thought it was so cruel and unfair that... Um, you know, we didn't think it was appropriate to have it in the game. And we, we may or may not be uh, doing something with it again for later. You'll see. Um, do we have a search program to find the solutions for levels? We actually do have an AI search program. The problem is that there's very few levels that we can use it on. Because the levels just bifurcate too much for, for an AI search to work. Uh, there's a very small number of them that we've used it to sort of check that the solution exists and in some cases is unique up to the first n turns or whatever. Um, slept through the show, what did you miss? Well, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube, I'm going to upload it soon. Um, how does it hurt to have a hard puzzle in the game? Uh, players can definitely have a negative experience if they go and play Impending Doom and they like, you know, bash their head against the wall for a few hours and get frustrated and then, you know, they, they never want to play again or like they just go and look up the solution online like th there's a number of ways in which they can have a negative experience um we do want to protect our players from having negative experiences and we want to sort of um let me put it this way we want to set them up for enjoyment of that level like we have a system in our single player campaign of progression where you have to unlock uh new missions by earning expert medals um and when you get enough expert medals certain content will unlock for you and that at least forces us to, it, it forces the player to have met a certain threshold of skill or capability in solving those puzzles before they unlock access to a harder puzzle. And that's the type of progression that we want to have in place before stuff like Impending Doom is in the game. Protect the players that take out the GG emote. <laughs> um, okay, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you all for sitting uh, sitting with me as I showed off some of this cool stuff that I uh, made many decades ago. Um, it's not cool. It's really lame. <laughs> but it's how I got started. Um, and thank you all for your questions. Uh, this week is a very busy week for me. Um, we're getting a whole bunch of launch materials ready, and it's, it's going to be insane. So I don't know when the next podcast is. I might not get to it until next weekend, um, six, seven days from now. But I will do another one. Uh, not sure what the topic is yet. Uh, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Uh, hopefully we'll have a launch date as well in the next week or so, and maybe a Steam page being up. <laughs> maybe. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Until then, I will see you next time. <laughs>